What's good, TMG fam? It's your boy, L, and I'm back with another reaction. How y'all feel? Welcome back to the channel. Salute. I got one question for y'all right now. Did they find somebody from the activist group? Activist. See, I've been thinking so much about what's going on in the world. I'm saying activist. The hacktivist group. Anonymous. Did they find anybody? Because on the thumbnail for this video, on the thumbnail, I kid you not, was somebody who looked like they had on one of the masks from the the anonymous hacktivist group. So it, it, it had me thinking like, oh man, did they catch somebody? So I'm here, man. This is the FBI's worst nightmare. Finally caught. I don't believe it. I'm not going to believe it, but I'm here to hear it for myself. We're going to check out that video along with the world's strongest borders interested to see how that goes all right so if you're new to the channel man hit the subscribe button join the fam just check it out as technology and computers revolutionized themselves at the turn of the 21st century so did black hat wearing hackers no hacker of this era has a tale more enthralling more topsy-turvy and more morally divisive than that of ukrainian tech whiz maxim popov after voluntarily turning himself over to the authorities and picturing a free life in America as a security expert, the FBI blindsided him. Then, following years of collaboration, jail time, and FBI success stories, Maxim threw a curveball of his own, taking an innocent agent down in the process. His targets bled millions, and his schemes were so widespread and intricate that even the top detectives remained fooled. Turns out that this mole was never really a mole. As a youngster growing up in the Ukrainian city of Zytomyr, two hours west of Kiev, it didn't take long before Maxim Popov was finding his feet in the computer world. Maxim Popov. <laughs> the, ma the names be killing me. Mastered the technical basics by using the school computers. While Americans were learning on the IBM XT, Maxim was developing his skills on a Kiev-based company clone called the Poisk One. He was obsessed with cyberpunk fiction and rewatched the 1995 movie Hackers with Angelina Jolie more times than he could count. Through his teenage years, Maxim's mantra became obvious. He was going to be a computer hacker, and he was planning to make a lot of money while doing so. It wasn't until Maxim's father bought him his very own PC as a 15-year-old that he could put his fascination and vision into practice. Legitimate tech jobs were few and far between, while computer-savvy young programmers were aplenty. This imbalance led to hordes of young hackers, with Maxim Popov at the core. While not the most technically talented hacker out there by any means, Maxim combined the skills he did master with a social edge. He had an insatiable talent for manipulating people. His first target? stolen credit card numbers. Oh. He would call up American cell phone and computer retailers, put on a near-perfect accent, and then direct the companies to cash out the accounts directly to him. This worked like a charm for a while. However, retailers eventually saw a pattern emerge with Eastern European shipping Always happens, what happens? You get greedy every single time. It never fails, bro, you get greedy. Something that you could have figured out, glitch in the matrix, glitch in the system, you figure it out, you making money, you can't stop. That's what always catches you, man. It's the greed. It's not knowing when to let up. Nah, because you start depending on the money, everything, man, and it goes downhill from there. Addresses, so the opportunities dried up. From there, it was a transition into the extortion game. Working with a crew, Maxim would break into well-known American-based companies' digital frameworks, steal their data, and then approach them with an offering. Credit card data from 38,000 customers of eMoney, a former electronic payment provider, now sat in Maxim's pocket. Then, another 16,000 dossiers of personal information were ransacked from Western Union. With this data at his disposal, Maxim contacted the companies and offered to put a stop to the intrusions and destroy the stolen information on one condition. They hire him as their security consultant, which typically came with fees of anywhere between 50,000 and 500,000 American dollars. E-Money didn't just sit back and allow themselves to be taken advantage of. They were secretly in contact with the FBI while the whole ordeal was going down and were stringing Maxim along as the authorities added to their pile of investigative material. Meanwhile, tensions in Zydermer were rising, as was the threat of violence. So Maxim formed a bold idea to move to America, turn himself in to the FBI voluntarily, take a slap on the wrist as punishment, and work in tandem with the authorities as a computer security expert. Yo, yeah, they be... <laughs> that, that was like the question we asked each other the other night. Would you go to 
jail for 10 years for like $100 million. This dude was willing to go to jail because he knows the governments, they need hackers like him, bro. Their resources are limited. They don't have the resources to find them, the capabilities. So they're limited. They need these guys, bro. So he already knew that, know that. He just played upon it. Smart. Rather than work against them, then he could transition into his own internet startup company and bring in the big bucks. He'd been in wow. contact with the American authorities up to this point, and they were on board, coming across as friendly and cooperative. He did get on the plane to the U.S., and he did intend to work with the FBI, but they had other ideas. As soon as he set foot on American soil, it was clear that the arrangement had been altered, and there was nothing that Maxim, an admitted criminal, could do. The FBI threw Maxim into a small isolation room. They presented a choice. Option A, Maxim could become an FBI informant, working around the clock to lure his former criminal partners into a sticky FBI trap. Or option B, Maxim could go to jail. Without much wiggle room, he cooperated with the FBI over the next 24 hours in a test environment. They instructed him to talk to his friends in Russian online chat rooms while the FBI monitored every message. However, Max was only pretending to cooperate. In reality, he was interweaving Russian colloquialisms into his messages to warn his associates that he was now an American government mole. Three months later, the translations made their way onto the desks of the FBI agents. Oh, hell. <laughs> He doubled down on it. He was like, oh, so y'all gonna get me? Nah, I'm gonna get y'all. Y'all lied to me, making me think I, I was gonna get a job from y'all. So, yeah, I told y'all I was gonna cooperate. But instead, nah, I'm gonna warn my homies and let them know that I'm a mole. Yo, this is crazy how this is all intertwined like that. Who quickly realized that they, this time, had been played for fools. Maxim was taken out of his safe house and thrown into a small county jail to face charges for his past cyber crimes. While all of this was taking place, computer hacking in the wider world was only increasing. The volume of spam and phishing emails was increasing. Credit card fraud was escalating. 2001 served as a key turning point with the debut of a hacking website called Carter Planet. Not only was this ominous underground property a thieves paradise for buying and selling stolen credit card numbers, passwords, bank account details, and identities, and as this site gained notoriety, it caught the eye of an up-and-coming FBI computer crimes agent from the Santa Ana, California office, Ernest E.J. Hilbert. Agent Hilbert was well aware that having a native Russian speaker and experienced cyber thief on his side could be the masterstroke that could unravel this entire website and bring in far more seasoned cyber criminals. So in order to sway Popov to join FBI's so-called intelligence gathering mission, Hilbert needed to do two things. One, assure him that this time the FBI was not intending for Popov to rat on his friends. And two, he needed to stroke Popov's ego saying things like, <clears throat> I truly respect your skill set. Those factors was enough to get the Ukrainian on board. As much really? as Maxim detested the idea. Really, you that easy? You, you, you that easy? He didn't even have to whine and die. You just gave you a few pickup lines. That's it. <laughs> that's it. That's, that's all it took. Yeah, working for the FBI, it was a sight for sore eyes compared to the inside of a jail cell. Every day, Hilbert and another agent would collect Popov, keep him shackled and handcuffed as they led him to their car, oh, and then no. drove to a nearby office. Man, I gotta do this all while shackled in some handcuffs? I'm not doing that, bro. No. Release me. Let me be free while I hack. <laughs> this building decked out with desks and a handful of Windows computers and a Cyrillic keyboard. This routine soon became known as Operation Ant City, during which Popov, who now had a new digital identity, would hang out in underground European chat rooms and post about Carter Planet. In the eyes of the digital underworld, this guy was a big time Ukrainian scammer who wanted nothing more than stolen credit cards and lots of them. Popov's first scalp was a mysterious Ukrainian hacker known only as Script. The pair spoke online, eventually agreeing on a deal this mystery hacker named Dennis Pinhouse, who was actually Maxim Popov working with the FBI, would buy $400 worth of stolen credit card numbers from Script, and Script would send them to California. But by mailing the contraband out of the Ukraine onto U.S. soil, Script committed a federal crime in U.S. jurisdiction, which helped persuade Ukrainian police to arrest him. In February of 2003, Data Processing International, or DPI for short, was hacked leaving the information of 8 million credit cards exposed. As Popov searched for answers into the DPI hacking, he came across a 21-year-old Russian student called RES. RES claimed that he knew the three hackers responsible and was willing to negotiate a deal. 
So Popov kept digging. He offered to buy all 8 million cards for $200,000. However, up until this point, he'd only made small purchases, and RES didn't believe for a second that Popov actually had $200,000 in his bank account. Fortunately, Agent Hilbert came up with a solution. He, Popov, and an entourage of FBI agents were shuttled to a nearby bank that had agreed to cooperate with the scheme. In a hidden back room, bank staff brought out $200,000 in $100 bills from the vault and placed it on a table. With cameras rolling, Popov rifled through the wads of cash and explained in phrases in Russian which translated into things like, look, I'm showing you the dough and I'm showing it to you at point blank range. The video worked like a charm. Popov knew that all Eastern European hackers really wanted was a job. As a thank you gesture for completing the deal, Popov directed RES to apply for a company that Popov allegedly worked for which was fake and set up by the FBI, of course. Arias applied using his real name. And just like that, the FBI had all it needed. Oh my God, bro. <laughs> Hook, line, and sinker. He reeled you in, bro. Okay, pop off. Hey, hey, they gotta, they gotta start bowing to your greatness. In total, the operation had removed 400,000 stolen credit cards from the black market and alerted over 700 companies that they'd been breached by Eastern European hackers, adding up to millions of dollars worth of foiled scams. Throughout all of these ploys, Popov and Agent Hilbert developed a rather strong bond. On one Thanksgiving day, rather than spend another 10 hours solving cybercrimes, Hilbert surprised his hacker with a projector, a Lord of the Rings DVD, and a complete Thanksgiving meal. They trusted one another. After eight months behind bars and working on Operation Ant City, Popov was released. The FBI rented him a place on the beach in Santa Ana, but he couldn't adjust to life in suburban California. So a judge granted him permission to visit Ukraine, provided that he returned to California shortly after to serve out the remainder of his supervised release. Agent Hilbert drove Popov to the airport and said goodbye, knowing full well that he wouldn't see the cunning hacker again. Right. Taking advantage of the strong relationship that the pair had formed, Popov began feeding Hilbert a steady stream of tips on the basis of good faith while back in Ukraine. One of these tips led Hilbert to a Russian hacker gang called X.25. This group had hacked companies like AT&T, but also hacked the FBI itself. Thanks to Popov's help, Agent Hilbert had found the man responsible, an engineering student in St. Petersburg named Leonid Edel Sokolov. Hilbert got Sokolov to admit the wrongdoings, but then it fell apart in an instant. In reality, these good faith tips were part of a larger plan, a black hat plan. Popov was working together with X.25 and Sokolov. X oh, <laughs> double cross with the triple cross. Oh. X.25 would hack and then Maxim would come in and save the day for a hefty fee at the company's expense, of course all while throwing around the FBI agent Hilbert's name as someone who could vouch for his credibility. In essence, Popov was now sabotaging the FBI from the inside. For the AT&T job alone, Maxim Popov was asking for $150,000. Back in the US, Hilbert was under investigation on suspicion of conspiracy, fraud against the government, and leaking confidential law enforcement information. At the end of this roller coaster, Maxim Popov still views Hilbert as a friend, saying, quote, he was the only friend I had. I'm still a black hat and I never changed, but who cares? I still love him." End quote. Can you ever trust a criminal? Share your thought. Bro, do not ever in your life trust a hacker, bro. Don't trust a hacker. I don't care if you're a cop, you're an FBI agent, don't do it, bro. He took them on a ride. Yo! Crossing the border into another country is as simple as whipping out a passport, getting a stamp, and away we go, right? Wrong. Belgium and the Netherlands still can't decide where one country ends and the other begins, while the path between the USA and Russia literally disappears in the summertime. As you're about to see, not all borders have barbed wire fences and guard dogs to help keep people out. A handful of nations go to great, unnecessary, sometimes confusing, and sometimes co- Yeah, the ones that don't have a lot of heavy, heavy artillery for you, bro. <laughs> 
They don't need that other stuff that everybody else need. They got what they, well, they got what you need. Comical links in order to keep the borders intact. Our curious country crossing journey begins with a trip over to the divider between Belgium and the Netherlands. You might sleep in the same bed with your partner and yet wake up in separate countries. That's the anomaly at hand in the Netherlands municipality of Barley, Nassau. It's located right here. That's crazy. You could be in the same bed with somebody and be in two different countries, bro. That's crazy to me. And as you can see by the map, it's home to nearly 30 Belgian enclaves. What is an enclave? Think of the Vatican City as an example. It's a state, territory, or part of a country that is entirely surrounded by the territory of another country. All these Belgian enclaves are known collectively as Barley Hertog. The borders separating the two nations cross through streets, restaurants, and even residential buildings. You could have breakfast in Belgium and lunch in the Netherlands and still have never left your own house. As strange as it seems, in the past, for tax reasons, people have moved their front doors into the other country to save a few bucks. Oh, that's cr That's smart, though. Hey, whatever you got, man, these days, whatever you got to do to save a dollar, bro. If that means put my front door, just don't leave my front door, like a portion of my house, in this country so I can save money? I'm doing it, bro. I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm doing it. The area came to be this way on the back of far too many historic land swaps dating as far back as the Middle Ages when parcels of land were divided up between different local families. At first glance, Jim's Corner may look like nothing more than a roadside convenience store or service window. But what you see before you is, in reality, a tiny border crossing. This bizarre intersection of the USA and Canada is found between Minnesota and Manitoba. That's in Canada, by the way. It's located right here and has been dubbed the Northwest Angle Crossing. And if you want to step over country lines, you'll need to make a video phone call from that convenience store looking check-in point Jim's Corner. While the Northwest Angle region is technically part of the USA, unless you've got wings, the only way to get to it is by driving through Canada. Apart from Alaska, this small enclaved part of Minnesota is the northernmost point in the USA. Logically, it would seem that this area of about 123 square miles should be in Canada. However, it belongs to the USA because the British and the Americans based their land negotiations on a flawed map drawn by John Mitchell in 1755. A map which, as you can see, did not accurately depict the actual shape of the Lake of the Woods. Both Great Britain and Canada tried to eliminate the Northwest Angle, offering to buy it back from the USA, mm. but Uncle Sam refused. The USA and Canada might have a comedic cartography slip to deal with. But at the end of the day, thanks to free travel between countries for most citizens, it's no big deal. Over at the dividing line of the Korean Peninsula that splits North Korea from South Korea, the situation plays out a little differently. Korea's demilitarized zone is one of the most tense, feared, and vilified borders in the world, and has been since 1953 after the two nations' ideological wars. The dividing line is 155 miles long and 2.5 miles wide. At the center of the DMZ, you'll find the Joint Security Area. That's here in Panmunjom. While the North Korean animosity is well known, and their arsenal of weapons often feared, this area is considered no man's land. It's where representatives from each side meet up to negotiate. There's yet another layer to this zone called the Civilian Control Line. Spanning between 3.1 and 12.4 miles from Southern Limit Line, the CCL acts as a buffer with two purposes. The first, to control the entrance of civilians into the area, and the second, to protect the security of military facilities within that zone. Within the federal state of Tyrol in Austria sits the unique- Basically saying, you try it, you die. Like, they'll, they'll shoot you and go right and have lunch with the rest of that crew. Like, and not even think about you, bro. They probably leave your body laying right there. Area of Jungholz, one of the most peculiar geopolitical anomalies in Europe. Despite the fact that it's part of Austria, Jungholz is only technically accessible by Germany. There is merely one single point where Jungholz actually touches mainland Austria, and that's at the mountain peak of Sorgschrafen. The catch, however, is that there's no road over the peak. So the only method of entering Jungholz is from the west through Germany. Way back in 1342, the German lord who farmed there sold it to an Austrian, and it stayed part of Austria over the centuries, despite centuries of land negotiations and conflicts. These days, the town has both German and Austrian postal codes, 
and is a customs-free zone. Because of its weird border status, German banks have found loopholes, and as a result, the beautiful Alpine town has found itself emerging as a booming financial center. Sorgschroffen Mountain scrapes the sky at 5,364 feet. Over at the intersection of Pakistan and China, the Kunjarab Pass rockets far higher, climbing to 15,397 feet in elevation. Not only does this location offer breathtaking 360-degree mountain vistas, but the astounding height also gives Kunjarab Pass the title of the highest paved international border crossing in the world. Found at the most elevated point on the Karakol... Bro, the world is just beautiful, man. If you ever get into explore and and sightsee some of our most beautiful... Man, this this world has some places to see, man. Some things to see. Can't lie, I got, I'd have got a little nervous. Like, right up in here. See that, that road? And then, look... It's nothing but mountain. You know what I mean? Nothing out there, bro. <laughs> I'd have been a little nervous on that road. The international border crossing in the world. Found at the most elevated point on the Karakoram Highway, formerly known as the China-Pakistan Friendship Highway, this border crossing is the only connector between China and Pakistan. More often than not, travelers approach this border crossing full of nerves and anxiety. What if they don't let me in? What if they forgot to stamp my passport? I took out all the exotic fruit from my suitcase, right? These questions and more are all but forgotten once you get a glimpse of the stunning Karakoram Mountains in the background or one of the several glaciers en route. Time for a quick bit of trivia. Who was paying attention in geography class? Not me. Okay, not including Canada or Mexico, which country is situated closest to the United States? The answer? Russia. Anyone guess that? Give the video a quick like if you nailed it. That's right, just 2.4 miles separates Russia from the USA. Yes, 2.4 miles, you, you heard that correctly. In the narrowest part of the Bering Strait sit the Diomede Islands, which are made up of two major islands and a few other scattered rocks. Big Diomede Island, or sometimes called Ratmanov Island, belongs to Russia, and Little Diomede Island belongs to the USA. As the frosty winter winds roll around year after year, ice bridges form between the two islands. This means that, yes, theoretically, you could walk between America and Russia. That doesn't mean you should, though. Because unless you're one of the hundred or so population that live on Little Diomede Island, it's generally prohibited to visit the area. From the bitter cold of the Arctic, we're changing gears and heading down to the searing desert heat of Africa. And see, this is why you gotta know this stuff, bro. Before you end up someplace you have no business, bro. <laughs> you can't, and you can't phone home by the time you get there, bro. Once you're there, you're in it. Probably be a while before you make it back home, if you make it back home. Africa, where Sudan and Egypt have been locking horns in a strange border rivalry for years. Take a look at this map. The two distinct areas have been causing headaches for these nations. First off, meeting the Red Sea, we've got the Halaib Triangle. Both countries claim that they own Halaib. Then we have the checkered area of Bir Tawil, which, ironically, neither country will admit to owning. That makes Bir Tawil the second largest unclaimed landmass on the planet after Antarctica, of course. Technically, nobody owns Antarctica because of a treaty set up in 1959. We've got an entire video about it. Check it out after this one. The link is in the description. But why would neither country want to claim Bir Tawil? At this point, it's essentially free land. The answer is because if either side were to declare ownership, then they would weaken their claim to the disputed territory of the Halaib Triangle, which is a much more desirable and inhabitable location. Damn right, we stubborn. We stubborn. <laughs> In January of 2000, Sudan withdrew its armed forces from the Triangle, effectively relinquishing control of the border zone to Egypt, whose forces have occupied and administered the area ever since. That said, tensions have flared up again in recent years. Over at the Haskell Free Library and Opera House, which straddles the international border in Rock Island in Quebec and Derby Line in Vermont, rather than compete for that land, Canada and the USA decided to share. This unique establishment holds the title as the only library in the world that serves two countries at once. The entrance is on the US side of the border, and the books are on the Canadian side. The Opera House stage is in Canada, and the seats are in the US. For those reasons, it is remarkably referred to as both the only library in America that has no books and the only opera house in Canada that has no stage. Americans can simply walk in the front door, but getting in is a little trickier for Canadians. 
While nobody will be stamping their passport, they have to technically cross the international line, a line made up of a cement obelisk and a slew of eye-catching flower pots. In recent years, the area around the 100-plus-year-old library has seen a significant tightening of security. U.S. Homeland Security and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police patrol nearby. The streets are lined with cameras, and there's almost always a border guard sitting out front in an SUV. From the north of the USA to the south, the meeting point between California and Mexico at the intersection of San Diego and Tijuana is one of the most popular, most trafficked, and most unique crossings in the continent. Near the San Isidro port of entry, which is the fourth busiest border crossing in the world, is Friendship Park, a half-acre... Imagine how much stuff that they some people try to get through, get by. Imagine how uh, on guard and alert they have to be day in and day out, man. Place as busy as that? You know people trying to smuggle in. Her plaza overlooking the Pacific Ocean that belongs to both Mexico and the USA. Here, people are free to hang out with their comrades from across the border, all overseen by official guards, of course. This was part of an overhaul of the whole San Isidro border that took 10 years and cost roughly $741 million. Ooh. The artwork near the border is far more impressive than anything you would expect to find at a political intersection as well. Despite fences and three checkpoints of security, locals are often spotted having conversations with each other between the giant wooden pillars. Perhaps not for long, because some of these spots are beginning to be replaced by the giant Mexico-USA border wall, a $21.6 billion proposal. Over 30 million people enter the United States at the San Isidro crossing every year. At our next border point, sometimes over the span of an entire year, not a single person steps across this border. When you hear its location, you'll understand why. At 29,000 feet above sea level, and at the highest point on Earth, the China-Nepal border line runs across the summit of Mount Everest. There's obviously no customs station at these dangerous altitudes, so theoretically you could walk up through Nepal and walk down through China, although we wouldn't recommend it. If you cross the border at Mount Everest, or any other illegal spot, heavy fines, country bans, or even jail time are all possibilities. It's been done before. In 2017, a climber from Poland crossed from China into Nepal on the summit and was slapped with a 22,000 US dollar fine and a 10-year Nepalese climbing ban. What? I hope it was worth it, bro. <laughs> I hope it was worth it. You got a real story to tell. $22,000 and a 10-year ban. Man, please, bro. I, I ain't got 22 to give you, fam. I don't, man. You're going to have to, uh, y'all got community service? That's what I'd be trying to, yo, 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 it's judge. Can your boy get some community service or something like that? Like, ain't no way. Nah, fam, we not doing that. <laughs> Listen, man, y'all get at me in the comment section. Let me know what y'all think. I thought somebody from the hacktivist group Anonymous was caught. They had it in the thumbnail. I was wrong, but still, pop off. Took them for a ride, man. Y'all let me know, man. Till the next reaction video on my piece, y'all stay solid. Hey.